Dear friends and family in Christ, truly it is a joy each and every day that Christ has risen from the grave and that we too shall rise. May this be the joy. May this fill your hearts with passion every day. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that you have sent your Son Jesus to take on human flesh, to die for our, on our behalf, to give his life so that we might have life eternal. We pray that each day that we would just remember this promise, remember this blessing. Help us each day to remember that you are with us always, that although at times we feel apart, that you never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, may this be our hope, may this be our joy, until we walk with you in eternity. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stranger danger. Many of you, as uh, recent uh, as you have children, or as you were children at one time yourself, uh, have heard this phrase, stranger danger. It's a simple phrase, which you can figure out quickly, is a quick reminder for children to be careful to not to get into people's car, not to talk to strangers, not to talk to certain people who they don't know. And there was probably a time in your life where you remember where strangers were not so dangerous. But now, in the day and age that we live in, we have to have all kinds of safeguards in place because certain strangers are dangerous. I remember when I was growing up, there was a song that was on Sesame Street. Now, that kind of tells you, I think that's still on TV, but uh, uh, probably all reruns now, but it said, the song went, Danger, It's No Stranger. And how true it is, it is all around us in certain strangers. Last year, my family and I, we went to my sister Abby's, uh, my youngest sister Abby's, uh, it was her internship placement service. I know that's a whole lo- bunch of words together, but she was preparing to become a director of Christian education in, our, in the church, and, and, she, and we went to attend to see where she would be placed to support her, and uh, while we were there, we figured we're going east, and we're going a few thousand miles east, so we might as well see friends and family. We traveled up to see our friends, uh, the Huttons, who were up in northern Wisconsin, and they took us one day to this place called Monkey Joe's. We got to Monkey Joe's, and Oh, Monkey Joe's is basically, if you know what a bounce house is, imagine about 30 of them all together under 1,200 square feet of, of a warehouse. Anyhow, we, we got there, and this is a place for kids to play and parents to play. And, and, but the first thing they did was they put, rolled back Jacob's sleeve. It was cold after all. And they put a little bracelet around his, his wrist. Then they w- rolled back Carla's sleeve. They put a bracelet around her wrist. If you held the bracelets up to each other, you could tell that they, were the, that they were the matching bracelets. And the reason they did this is because of the stranger danger. They did this because they wanted to make sure that no child could leave their facility with someone they did not enter with. We were thankful, sad that you have to do that today. Because like I said, and probably many of you remember a time in your life maybe where there wasn't so much stranger danger. But in this day and age, there is. And the reason I bring this up is because even though we shouldn't have to talk about those disciples on the road to Emmaus being in any stranger danger, weren't they after all? Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that they were in physical danger, that Jesus was about to kidnap them or that he was about to, uh, to uh, lead them off a cliff or something like that. But they were about to have their lives changed in ways that they never realized. They were about to have their hearts changed in an unexpected way, in a way that they could not prepare for, in a way to some of us that might seem somewhat dangerous. Because after all, isn't that Christian walk a little dangerous? Let's go back to that that road to Emmaus. It's only 60 stadia. It's about seven miles walk between Jerusalem and Emmaus. The disciples, as they were walking along, they probably were pretty sad, pretty downhearted. Scripture says that when Jesus asked them what they were talking about, that they were saddened. As we walk along with them, we know, we can imagine what they must have been going through. Losing someone they loved, witnessing the terrible things that had happened, and all this probably in a time they thought they were going to celebrate. Here they had probably come to Jerusalem for Holy Week. They had come to see this great rabbi preach. They had come to celebrate the Passover. But now everything was upside down. We've gone through times in our lives that way, haven't we? So we can walk with those disciples towards Emmaus. 
not so much of a walk, but more of a trudge, more of sadness. Every step weighs more than the last. And then the stranger comes along. We don't recognize him at all. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly why they didn't recognize him. Maybe it was divine intervention. Maybe it was because it was starting to get dark. We don't know. All we know is that when he spoke to them, he spoke to them with authority. He spoke to them in a way that was not just accepting this poor me attitude they had. Because after all, wasn't that the attitude they had? This poor me attitude. Oh, me, oh my, pity me because things didn't go my way. No, look, listen to again how Jesus responds to them right away, how he starts his Sunday School 101 lesson. How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Did not the Messiah, the anointed one, didn't he have to suffer these things so that you could be saved? As they walked along, as we walk with them, even still, as Jesus preaches, as he teaches, we know that there's something about the message, but we can't put our finger on it. Then he's about to go on a little further. And we know it's only proper to invite him in. Because after all, walking along this road, there could be dangerous strangers along the way. We wouldn't want a bandit or a robber to attack him. So we invite this stranger in. And then the crescendo of the evening hits. As he breaks the bread, things change. Hearts change. When Jesus comes into a person's life, when Jesus speaks and teaches in a person's heart, things change. The resurrection changed everything for the disciples. The resurrection changed their hearts. Did not their hearts burn within them? Did they not have a passion in them? that they could not explain until he broke that bread. And that passion was Jesus Christ alive. The promise that they would one day rise with him. I wonder if sometimes we struggle to know exactly what those disciples were talking about. How long has it been for you since you've had one of those moments where your heart burned within you? where you were overcome by the passion of the Holy Spirit, and you realized that if you did not praise the Lord in that moment, that you would not be able to, that you would just explode. How long? But maybe it was, maybe there's a hymn, a certain verse, that as you sing that verse, when we sing it, just everybody singing it together on the right key, it just speaks to your heart. Maybe it's, it's, it's when you've helped out someone in need. You, you had a piece of extra sandwich. You had a gift card or an extra couple of bucks. And you knew you could see that you were helping someone. Maybe it was that you were meeting over a Bible study with a couple of friends. And as you were going through God's word, as they opened, as, as you read the same verse you read a hundred times, you'd read that verse over and it, all of a sudden you heard it in a new way. Maybe it was when you were reunified with someone whose relationship was broken that you haven't talked to for a long time, but finally, through tear-stained faces, with embraces, you said your forgiveness to one another. Maybe you know what I am talking about. But I fear many Christians, it's been a long time since they've had that burning within their hearts that passion for what Christ has done. I fear that for many of us, that it's far and few between. That for us, it's rare to have these experiences. Maybe even for some of you, you've never experienced this feeling. Now, lest you think that it's all about feelings, I don't want to go, too, go down that road just yet, but there is something to be said about that change that God does in your heart. And it is more than a feeling. It is more than an emotional response. It's more than just for one moment crying and more than one moment laughing and more than one moment not even being able to explain the emotion. 
Because when the Spirit comes within you, when God claims you as his very own, it's something that you can't explain. I can't explain. No doctor or PhD could explain. But I wonder, when is the last time you had that burning in your heart? For many of us, maybe it's because we don't have time. Maybe our lives are so busy. We know that we have to be here, there, and everywhere all at once. We know that there's so many stressors, things that we're already thinking about this afternoon for tomorrow. Maybe for some of you, it's so many gadgets and gizmos. You have your your smartphone and your tablet and you have your television and you have uh, your music playing and, and there's always some kind of noise in the background. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's not just a matter of time or priorities, but fear. Because having that change in our lives, having that change in our hearts, it means letting go. It means that we are not the ones in control. It means we are not the master of our destiny but turning it over to God. Here we have this beautiful confession that Christ places his name upon our hearts in baptism. This beautiful promise that he's always with us in his supper. The promise that he walks with us every step of every day. But how often, how often do we struggle to let go, to put things into his hands, how often do we struggle to take that step because we fear it might be dangerous? We step out. We expose ourselves. It's more than just saying we trust God, but actually trusting Him. It's more than looking at the world around us and saying, Lord, I know it's in your control, but I have to do something. But saying, Lord, I know it's in your hands. Many of us, it's hard for us to let go. That old pride lives within us. That pride continues to lead us to think that, well, no, there's got to be a part that I can do. There's got to be something. I've got to hold on to the reins of my life at least a little bit. And that's why we go to Luke 24. That's why we, again, walk along this road to Emmaus because we realize that when Jesus came, as Jesus walked with those disciples, he walks with us. And we need to be reminded that each and every day he walks with us. But it was not just about that walk. It was about what happened. It was about the fact that Jesus didn't just come into the world, that he didn't just die, but he did indeed rise. He did indeed conquer sin death and the devil. He is our champion and he is our victor. It is not just a matter of something we say, but it is true belief in our hearts. And that belief in our hearts, it is what gives us passion and joy to live each day. To live in this world, to know that God is the one who's in control and that God is the one who has a plan for our lives. To live each day in this world knowing that, that each day is a gift from him and an opportunity to serve him. Knowing that had he not come, had he not died, we would have no hope. See, if, if Christ hadn't come, if he was a mere stranger to us, truly there'd be a danger that we would not want to face. A danger that we don't like to talk about, and that danger is hell. That danger of hell that we do not know Christ, if only know him as a stranger, that he is prepared for his enemies. But thanks be to God that he sent his son Jesus, that he sent Christ Jesus into our world, the anointed one, the one who was chosen before the foundation of the earth to be our salvation. No longer was this just a preposterous promise that the, the, the ladies had said, but this was the sure certainty of salvation in human form. And 
Jesus. He gave his life. He died. He rose out of his passionate love for you. His passionate love for you. And some, a lot of times we connect passion to marriage, and rightfully so. Because the love that God has for you is just like the love that a bridegroom has for his bride. Isn't that why Jesus uses that very imagery in Scripture? Because as he looks at you, as he, as he tied the knot with you, he devoted his life forever to you. He made that promise that even if you were not faithful to him, he would love you. Even if, even if you, there were times where you stumbled away in the marriage, he'd come right after you, chasing you down. And that is what he does. Each and every day, our Lord Jesus Christ, he chases after you. Even if your heart has not burned with passion in a long time, even if you've never had that burning passion, he continues to pursue you. He continues to chase after you. Because he wants one day, he wants one day, he wants to pick you up, carry you over the threshold of his house, say, welcome home. Welcome home to my heavenly kingdom. Welcome home to your heavenly kingdom. Christ has risen. That is our hope. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you that you have given your life on the cross for us, taking on human form, giving your body and blood so that we might have life eternal. We pray, Lord, that also that, that we would always remember that not only did you die, but that you have risen and that you even now are preparing a place that we might spend eternity with you. Lord, we pray that each day our hearts would burn with the hope and the passion, not a mere emotional response, Lord, but the full assurance and hope and joy of knowing that we are yours, that you have called us your bride, and that your love for us grows each day. Even though sometimes it's undeserved, you continue to pour it out upon us. Lord, may we know this love and this passion that you have for us. May we love you as you have first loved us. In all things we pray, in our risen Savior's name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Alleluia, Christ has risen.